You're listening to Talking Tunes, and joining us online today is... It's Matthew Whitaker. People would know you better from uh, other guises, right? Uh, yes, I have an alter ego, you know. Uh, he's called Spore, and he's performed in the band Henge. We've got a fantastic lineup of uh, 15 tunes, very diverse styles. Starting out with Perry and Kingsley, the unidentified flying object. From 1966, I guess this is a heavy influence on Henge and, and the music you're making, right? Yeah, well, I mean, listen to it. It's, pr- it's pretty fun, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great way to start anything. I actually start the day, usually, with a bit of Perry and Kingsley. I find it's uh, better than coffee for getting you going. Completely agree with you. Yeah, music is the best way to start the day, especially uh, when you're out walking to work or whatever you're doing. Well, you, I think you'd, uh, you'd be sort of skipping to work if you listen to this. I mean, I think it quite well characterises the sound of Henge. There's definitely a playful element to it. Oh, definitely. I think, you know, all music sort of inherently comes from playing around and messing around with stuff and notes, and uh, this is just a really joyful example of that. Yeah, it's just fun. It's got lots of the sort of really crazy sounds in the tape loops uh, that make up the rhythm track, and then the, the sort of synth sounds are coming from... Moogs and, and a rare synth that Perry used called an ondialine, something like that. I uh, don't know how to pronounce it, but yeah, they were pioneers. You know, uh, a lot of, I find that a lot of early, um, early sort of synth music is, is really great fun, a good tonic to today's more serious sounding electronic music. That's where it all started, you know. <laughs> So you've gone from 1966 right up to 2019 with Paddy Steer, Lumpy Fat Man and some proper nice fat wobbly bass in this. Yeah, absolutely. For those who don't know Paddy Steer, really he's a, an inspirational figure. He makes all of his own synthesizers, you know, he performs like kind of a one-man band. He's got like a mutated drum kit that he sits around with stacks of modular stuff that he's built himself all around him. And he, he kind of somehow manages to trigger everything and, and make it all work. It's a bit more chaotic as a live experience, but his albums are, are wonderful. And this, this al- the album this is from, Archipelagon, is, is a bit more uh, towards capturing a live sound in his gigs. But yeah, he's, he's just a, a wonderful guy. Uh, he's Manchester, everyone in Manchester knows him. He's kind of like a, a sort of father figure to a lot of musicians around here um, and yeah his albums are wonderful Ch- uh, check them out He's, get them on Bandcamp it's, it's great stuff so in Henge give me a quick rundown on uh, your intergalactic conglomeration of uh, people yes uh, well Henge is a collection of aliens and and one human from various parts of the universe. I play a character called Spore, who's a space traveller, kind of a, a bit of a jester, a bit of a clown, and a sort of inventor, experimenter of in evolution, dabbler in, in worlds, and uh, yeah, a musician. A Henge have been on Earth for six years now. We've been spreading cosmic vibrations yeah, it's, it's just it's been a really joyful show. we managed to get back on tour now as well, which is good. Although, unfortunately, I've picked up coronavirus, as aliens are not immune to that. That's why I'm here at home, instead of, I should be in Sheffield, playing show today. But it's okay, I'm all right. I'm over the worst of it, and uh, fortunately, I've been vaccinated, so it's not put me in hospital or anything. Um, yeah. Good to hear. You've seen War of the Worlds, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. That's how the, the Martians were killed off, is the fact that they weren't prepared for the viruses and bacteria on Earth. Yes, that's it, that's it. Spoiler alert, you know, when, when the Martians all die at the end, it's because, you know, they got killed by the common cold. That's it. So we know that aliens obviously aren't uh, immune. Exactly. Well, they should have taken more precautions. If, if they're used to going around to different worlds, I can't imagine, you know, us getting out the spaceship with your helmet off if you found a place, you know what I mean? That's a good point. 
Yeah, I never thought about that because it's like these Martians from the War of the Worlds are going to lots of different planets. You'd be a bit miffed if the first planet you went to were like, ah, bollocks, we've got to keep our helmets on, like. Exactly, yeah, and it's just like if we go travel into the Amazon or something, you'll get six or seven jabs and take your malaria tablets and stuff. I imagine it's a bit more like that. I don't know how sort of dramatic that is. Is it is it cinematic to, to sort of everyone's medical records and and stuff? And I suppose when H.G. Wells was writing it, I suppose he didn't think about the logistical planning and, and, and as you say, the, the precautions that Martians should have taken. I know, short-sighted. That's all I can say. Yeah. From the base planet of Galactic Eight comes a sod off base sine wave eight. Otto von Skirach, Base Galactica. Skirach? <laughs> Interesting pronunciation there. How are you pronouncing it? Well, I think he pronounces it Shira. Ah. With as much sort of drama as that as well. And he's usually baring his teeth. He's vampiric. Uh, gnashes at you when he says that. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't sure how to pronounce it for years. Shirak. I used to say Shirak. But yeah, this is, this is fun as well, isn't it? It's kind of like Miami base science fiction B movie thing with lots of sounds in it. Lots of squat and squat and brrr, sort of stuff been thrown everywhere at you at an exceptional pace. Uh, it's, it's a banger. It's a total banger. And if anyone's seen me DJ either as Fierce Brosnan, which is another um, alias I have, or as Spore. Um, or even just as myself, I usually play this at some point, um, and, and I have done for like years now. It's, it's, I think it's just a B-side actually, another track which isn't as good in my opinion, called Bass Low. I've seen him a couple of times live, I've never seen him play this one, it feels like it's not really part of his canon, but... I think it's, it's my, well, it's my favourite track of his. I wanted to put something of his in because I feel like it's, uh, uh, it's been an influence on me of recent years. And it's quite connected to the old spiritual plane as well with his third eye and his triangles. Exactly. And uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure he's connected to the Illuminati, right? Well, he's part of a triangle family, but I think that's more to do with the Bermuda Triangle than the, the Illuminati one. Yeah, he's certainly very interested in decalcifying the pineal gland through the sort of cleansing power of base frequencies. I think this was, there's something in that, you know, it's, it's, it sounds sci-fi, but if you've ever experienced light, really, really loud bass, which I'm sure most of you listeners have at some point, then it does feel like it's got cleansing properties to it. You have some lizard people in Henge as well, though, don't you? Are they also part of the Illuminati, or are they not? Ah, so, like, they're not lizards. We have an amphibious creature oh. who plays drums in the band, but they're a Nomo, uh, and Nomo is uh, a sort of... That's a creature native to the planet of Xylanthia, in the Sirius star system, which you may be familiar with. Um, <laughs> it's not somewhere that many people have been, actually, from planet Earth, but it's a quite a swampy sort of bog planet, and um, it's a bit stinky, so it's not really much of a tourist destination. Is that why you keep them at the back then on the drums, keep them, you know, out of smell distance? Yeah, yeah, he can't smell, so he doesn't know giving it off. But yeah, it's, it's also quite important to sort of keep lubricated as well. It's quite, it's got like a viscous covering, so we, we can't let him get too dry. So 
if he were towards the front, the lights might dry out his, his tentacles a bit too much. He, he likes to keep him in really good condition. Um, it's quite important. It's great to be able to play to so many people and have this fun escapism, science fiction concept, all these things that extremely important you know they're just as important as in the case of Henge it's, it's actually combined with vital message about campaigning and a, a strong political message and the future of the human species from as well because like I've noticed they're all visually different characters so you're not all from the same planet we're not oh no no so we have one human in the band Grok who uh, obviously from planet Earth and Henge kind of formed as it is six years ago when uh, Grok helped to guide the, the Henge spacecraft down to Earth in a safe landing spot which was a ancient Neolithic monument which is how the name Henge came about and Grok plays synthesizers and we also have brother Goo who is a Venusian someone from Venus it's no longer inhabited as a planet um, the atmosphere is very toxic but it wasn't always that way it used to be quite pleasant but like planet Earth they had a, a runaway greenhouse effect and sort of climate catastrophe which resulted in the, the extinction of all but one Venusian. We, we saved Brother Goo, and he's the last of his kind. That's a bit of a warning for us on our planet then, really, to be paying attention and look what happened on Venus. Yeah, absolutely. And Brother Goo's been spreading that message on, while he's been on Earth. He's very conscious of that plight of humans. And uh, he plays bass, bass frequency oscillators and things like that. Yeah, and that's it, apart from uh, Spore, who I've told you about, who's from a distant galaxy. And, yeah, that's the four of them. Yeah. And you can find out, if you're interested in all of this stuff, uh, I might as well plug... Go for it. Henge comic book. What's well, something I want to talk about, yeah. Yeah, there's two, two episodes of that so far, so if you want to swat up on Henge Law, uh, that's a good place to, to start. Because that comic, that's drawn by the guy from... One of the guys from 2000 AD. Yes, yeah, so we, we worked together with two people from... 2000 AD. One of them was the script writer Tom Eglinton, who's also an amazing artist. And me and Tom cooked up the stories together. Tom's art was an expert in putting them into comic book form. And then the front covers were done by Boo Cook, who's also worked on 2000 AD. He's done Judge Dredd covers and things like that. And then the interior was by Phil Buckingham, who is uh, who does a lot of work with Heavy Metal magazine. So there, uh, there's a lot of expertise gone into these comics. They're, they're not just some homemade little bits of sort of nonsense. Yeah, they're very high quality products, is what I'm saying. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, 2018, for those that didn't know, you know, the, the legendary sci-fi graphic novel. I think it's still 2018 still going. Yes, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I remember reading them as a kid. That was the last time I saw them was when I was a teenager. Yeah, they're an institution. And then unfortunately I grew up. <sighs> Ah, shucks. When you was a kid growing up, what sort of sci-fi were you watching? I wasn't allowed to watch it. I wasn't allowed to watch E.T. Can you believe that? Wow. So yeah, I didn't watch any sci-fi until I got older. I wouldn't call myself a sci-fi nerd either, which is probably surprising to some people. It is, yeah. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Which is probably a good thing, because I think in the stuff that you're creating, it, it then comes original in what you're doing, because you're not having your thinking and creativity being swayed by stuff you've already seen in Star Trek, Star Wars, Back to the Future and all that sort of stuff. Yes, it's not maybe the sort of stuff that nerds would come up with. So don't feel like I'm a nerd about anything really. Even like music, I, I might have sort of tried to sound more well-read about the artists that we play today, but, you know, I was on Wikipedia... <laughs> As was I. ...20 minutes before you called. <laughs> As was I. Hey, 
way, look, we talked all the way through 808 State. Where we could talk about Love Love and stuff like that later on. Yeah. You had a remix. Your tune EXO was remixed by 808 State. I gotta say, when I saw that, it's like, wow. And what a brilliant tune, too. Yes. Yeah. Have you heard it yet? Uh, yeah. Sam sent me the promo for it. I had it on uh, the last radio show. Yeah. It's, it's a banger. It sort of sounds like a classic 808 State track. We're all really thrilled with it. And it's coming out on the 15th of October, which might be, I don't know. Well, I. At the time of recording, that's next Friday. This will come out on a Tuesday, so it'll be a few days in the future. Okay, it's coming out very soon. Yeah, and I picked Cubic there. It's my favourite 808 State banger. But also, I feel like the EXO remix in Cubic, there's a similar approach there. There's, there's, there's something reminiscent between those two tracks. And yeah, obviously, you can imagine my joy when Graham Massey sent the remix over and I, and I heard it and it sounded as banging as as banging as my favourite 808 State work. Yeah, it's, it's a real thrill and I, I, I see Henge as, as kind of like some kind of mutant strain, this Manchester rave lineage. So it's, it's great to feel like, like part of that because we put parties on in warehouses and stuff. They're all sort of sci-fi themed raves, but um, it certainly feels like some continuation of, of stuff that's gone on in the past in Manchester. For me, it's helping to tie a lot of threads together, um, which, which makes me really happy. And for those that don't know, obviously, 808 uh, State, they, they formed in Manchester in 1987 and some regard them as the pioneers of Acid House. So, uh, yeah, big names in the rave game. And, uh, yeah, warehouses, man, that sounds like excellent fun. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's sort of like part of this whole concept thing. It, it's a, an event we put on called Space Cassette, which is a sci-fi rave with loads of concept stuff, like the science fiction elements come through we like invent a story before the night which is kind of how we promote the event and and there's narrative elements that run through it there's sort of silly bits of theater all all very much cardboard and tinfoil aesthetic everybody comes dressed up the atmosphere is it's more like a bang face kind of atmosphere a, a, a crowd and bang face isn't something we've discussed yet but I know it, it always gets mentioned on your podcasts <laughs> it's always a running joke at this point yeah 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 but bang face is a huge influence on yeah on henge it's it's the one time of the year where we all go to bang face we all get inspired in one way or another and the sort of silliness of the event everything is really just fed into everything we do now for those of you who are at Bang face in apocalypse year 20, 2020. No, 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 I'm going to pause you there. I'm going to talk about craft work. I will come to that. You, you did a fill in set on Sunday. Yes. Because this is nearly running out, right? Craft work. Craft work. We need to talk about craft work. We need to talk craft work before it disappears. Craft work. The robots. Craft work, obviously, German band pioneers of what they call themselves robot pop. Interesting as well, craft work put out two rock albums. Did you know? Craft work, craft work too, before they actually started picking up the electronics. Did you know that? Right, is this early stuff? Yeah, the early stuff, yeah. Yeah, I haven't bothered to check it out. I heard that it was just like them jamming and I thought it was probably going to be pretty boring. You always take time to find your feet in a sound, though, don't you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good for them, but, like, it's not fair of me to uh, uh, just overlook that. But the, the reason I've chosen Kraftwerk for this is, well, this, this album, The Man Machine, is, I, I think it's immaculate in terms of, like, concept. They were just such an amazing concept band they obviously influenced everyone in electronic music the sort of the way that they discuss the subjects of industry transport communication technology this sort of me mechanical sounding music which just really suits the sort of german stoicism it's just it's perfect concept stuff and also like they are having fun honestly like you can't listen to the robots there without sort of you know wanting to robot dance around the house and it's it is it's fun stuff as well you know
big debate as to whether or not techno is an American thing or a European thing. Right. And some people would say, well, Kraftwerk 1978, then mm-hmm. that's the originators of techno. But hey, <laughs> we're, into, we're into the Beach Boys. Yeah. We're into the Beach Boys, Surfer Girl 1963. So we'll leave that techno origination debate from the front of the day. Absolutely. Well, the, the Beach Boys were a massive influence on Kraftwerk, and it's it's obviously it sounds like a bit of a weird thing to say if you don't know but yeah i never knew that well yeah i mean think about it beach boys what do you think about when you hear the beach boys you think of california surfing beaches that is an amazing concept band in itself and Kraftwerk really were inspired by the beach boys to become Kraftwerk to do their industrial their version of of what the beach boys were doing with that time and place so it's, it was a really surprising thing to learn that they've been such a, an influence on them. But also, when you think about it, the Autobahn, fun, fun, fun on the Autobahn, it's like it's a homage to fun, 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 the, the Beach Boys. That's an insight I've never heard before, but yes, I can totally see it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just this, this Surfer Girl is, is a very perfect piece of pop music. Uh, a, a song that sounds like it's always been there, you know, it, it, it wasn't written by anyone. It was just there, always, you know. You've really dug through the times, because this one's 1963. Um, huge span of music. I imagine you're the sort of person that just, like, needs some music, right? I mean, it goes without saying, digging through all sorts and not just sticking to one particular thing. Well, even here now with something completely different, right? Absolutely. Well, I, I, I'm just interested in a lot of different music. I, I kind of can't comprehend how someone would be satisfied just listening to techno. You get those people. I know I know they exist. I know some of them. And they just listen to techno. And that's it. I don't know how they live. So much good music out there. Yeah. My first memory would be you know, Bang Face 2017, a few hundred people in the room. But I see pictures of you online now. And you play it to like tens of thousands of people. Would that be an accurate reflection? Yes. Yeah. I um, mean, we we sort of became like a really popular festival act because seeing Henge is like quite an experiential thing. Festivals are about sort of going and losing yourself in this kind of fancy world. So I think just we got a lot of festival bookings and. Uh, over the years we've managed to sort of convince them to put us on the main stage so we've had huge crowds doing that and actually i was gonna say we played on the same stage as Kraftwerk at blue dot festival in 2019 so that was quite a special thing because blue dot festival is a festival of, of music and science and it's at jodrell bank which is is the massive telescope the stage is just in the shadow of that telescope as you will we played at the start of the day and Kraftwerk in 3d the end of it and it felt great you know it, it was like that thing it, was, it really just reminded me of this idea that it's sort of a concept band and it was it, yeah it was really special I've, I've picked this this is um leo brower who's a cuban guitarist and composer and i picked this because when i studied classical guitar that was my first instrument it was really I started learning classical guitar before I was interested in music and it was through classical guitar that I got into music in general. It feels like such an important place in my in my heart. And this this piece is it is beautiful. It sort of has a has a very pretty bit that you're hearing now. Uh, and then in the middle there's just an extremely exciting middle section uh, as well and it's kind of amazing that one instrument can make you feel so excited. Here it comes. I was at nine when I started learning classical guitar. I I went from that to just, I, I got really obsessed with it and I started writing songs as well around the age of 14, 15 and it was the only thing I ever wanted to do. Never. My parents said, oh, you better do a trade as well. You know, that classic thing. And I I didn't bother. Never the slightest bit of interest in anything else. And yeah, so not 
everyone will know this, but most people know me for Henge, but I do have a solo career, <laughs> inverted commas, as well, which it does incorporate this classical guitar background and also my love for jazzy chords and harmonic progression and also this sort of soundtracky epic sound you get from Ennio Morricone and John Barry and Henry Mancini and, and things like that. So yeah, I've got a solo album called The Man with the Anvil Hat. This is as Matthew Whitaker. This is my name, yeah, Matthew Whitaker, and, and that was out in 2016. And there's a follow-up record which is very nearly finished as well, called Songs for the Weary, which I've worked with a close friend who's a string arranger and producer, and uh, we've done lots of really schmaltzy, luscious string arrangements for it so there's like basically a string orchestra in there as one of the one of the characters in the music which has been something that's been so good to so rewarding to work on so i don't know when that's gonna come out you know uh, at some point in t- yeah maybe next year <laughs> i'll have to go and check that out yeah I, like i mainly predominantly listen to rave music or hard music listening to solo guitar wouldn't necessarily be the sort of thing I'd find but yeah it's beautiful music and this is what I love with this talking tunes you've come up with today is you've got such a wide spectrum of music and every track you've picked man it just rings with my heart I love it all love it all you mentioned bang face and now i feel obliged to follow up with because <laughs> as you say i do tend to talk a lot about bang face um 2017 uh there was a love love takeover and sam fez you know what an absolute geezer we could talk all day about him i, I total respect for the guy because he always has such passion for music and he's always got such a keen ear for finding projects that when when i saw you know he's got this band called henge and i think he made a bit of noise about it on facebook saying oh come and check this band henge out and i saw you guys in the Queen Vic, oh, it must have been a Sunday afternoon, perhaps. And straight away, I'm like, "Wow, <laughs> this is so bang face. This is brilliant." You're kind of not massively well known in 2017, I don't think, but uh, yeah, certainly come a long way since then, right? Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, uh, I must say it's strange to be talking about bang face over <laughs> first some classical guitar music and now some Ennio Morricone, but. Yes, it was in 2017. I mean, it shows that Sam Fez has got his ear to the ground, that he saw something in us uh, when we were certainly that obscure. Uh, I'm not saying we're like big now or anything, but we have uh, worked pretty hard and that comes from me particularly being just completely obsessed with it and getting to become a bit of a workaholic just because it's the thing that makes me buzz the most. Well, yeah, we've um, turned into a, an international act. Uh, we've released two albums since then. Our first disc was on Love Love Records, actually, called Cosmic Dross. And that was around the time that was coming out that we played at Bang Face. Uh, it was a sort of lovely bucket list thing to get to play at the, the best party in the world. Otto von Schirra was in the audience as well, and I was like, "Look over there, it's it's him." <laughs> yeah, it's it's one one of the wonderful things that now that I just feel like we're part of you know my, my musical heroes are people who I'm in contact with, and you know they're either remixing our stuff or some of my favourite acts are, are, are bands that I've actually got to support. Henge as well. Weirdly, that says something about 
my obscure taste in music, but also these people, they are heroes in my eyes. It's community though, isn't it? We all, we all stand on each other's shoulders, as it were. It is, yeah. It's wonderful. It's making me emotional now, this, <laughs> this music in the background. Ennio Morricone, the man with the harmonica, yeah. There's, there's a few songs on my album, The Man with the Anvil Hat, and you'll see a little, the echoing title there. There's a, f- a few very Ennio Morricone influenced tracks on there. One called Bones and another one called Ball and Chain. They're very epic, the sort of, sort of cowboy kind of chords. Um, that's not the whole sort of picture of that album. There's some sort of jazz ballad sounding tracks and some that sort of more folky kind of, you know, early sentence British folk kind of stuff. Yeah, have a listen. Go and check it out. It's on my band camp. Matthew Whitaker, band camp. Have a look. Don't confuse me with the other Matthew Whitaker. There's one pretty mediocre jazz piano player from America. You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be getting those two confused. I don't think. Derbyshire, real short track, so we need to keep uh, keep tight on this one. How on earth? How on earth you pronounce this track name? Though that sounds like something in your native language of sport. Uh, yeah, Agriculum. Zilzi, Zilzi. That's, I believe, how it's pronounced. That sounds like a mating call on your home planet. <laughs> yeah, it is, and this is. I mean, this gotta be one of the most alien-sounding things. That, that you've ever heard, right? Yeah. And Dahlia recorded the Doctor Who theme tune. She famously worked for the Radiophonic Workshop. She's a, a, a hugely inspirational figure and, and a wonderful person. I think this was the story behind this. It was some kind of theme tune for, like, a Isaac Asimov adaptation where robots took over or something. And the vocal sound, like... The words were like uh, some kind of incantation of like the robot saying you are our leader, a robot or whatever. And they sh- she reversed them and cut them up and it turned into that, which is just a bonkers piece of music, uh, considering how old it is. 1967. 67. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love th- I love stuff from that period. Uh, I love electronic music from 50s and 60s. I'm sure you know the backstory to the Forbidden Planet soundtrack. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Long story that we'll never get to. But yes, it's an interesting story as well there. And the fact that it wasn't even recognised as music. They, you know, they should have won an Oscar for that, but it wasn't even recognised because the mm. Musicians Guild were like, nope, electronic music, that's not music. It's sound effects. Yeah. Yeah, we've come a long way since then. But um, yeah, it's revolutionary. Absolutely. So when I heard this one, I'm like, God, this guy's got such fantastic music taste. Because I love this Indian stu... Well, sorry, I shouldn't say Indian, because the guy's from Pakistan, right? But, uh, yeah, this... Well, and I wouldn't even call it Bollywood, because I'm sure I'll get corrected there as well. <laughs> Tell me a bit about it. Yeah, in this case, it's Lollywood. So Bollywood, that's a concatenation of spoonerism, or whatever, you, however you say it, of um, Hollywood and Bombay. Uh, and then Lollywood is Lahore, eh? I think it's pronounced and, and, like, so Lollywood Pakistan but yes this I mean this just makes me so unbelievably happy this sort of arrangement of it this funny synth sounds sort of just and the, the joyous vocals and I don't know it's I, I, it, it, probably the piece of music that makes me feel the most happiness and I, I've been listening to it a lot 
from when I discovered it um, probably about six or seven years ago. And um, it, 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 I found it via a Finders Keepers compilation called The Sound of Wonder, which has got lots of... It's a compilation of stuff from a certain period of, you know, the, the Lollywood stuff. It's kind of like electronic... It's when electronic sounds were incorporated into it. Um, like, I guess, the late... The, maybe it was the 70s or something. And, yeah, it's, it's great, and uh, I, I can't get enough of it. I can't stop listening to it. They really convey emotion. This and lots of other music in you know, from Bollywood or Lollywood that you hear. That's a Mastra, uh, probably one of the best known female vocalists there as well. And yeah, they're just the emotion they get over is it, beautiful. It's beautiful music, as is everything that comes from India and, and Pakistan and that part of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think there's a certain there's a certain period of time as well. Like there is another Hollywood, which is Collywood. And um, I've got a Finders Keepers compilation of Maestro Ilayaraja stuff. And Collywood is uh, Chennai, so that's different part of India, different language. Um, uh, and, and it's sort of certainly like secondary kind of to, to Bollywood in terms of like the size. But there's some great sort of psychedelic stuff. I've got a compilation that's from like um, the late 70s and early 80s of like larger stuff. And again, it's it's got this vibe. It's just like loads of fun. And and, and the sort of theatre of it and the, the sort of storytelling and stuff that's necessary within that, it just puts so much into the music that, that just gives it so much to go on it's, it's brilliant Talandar, Saki Shahbaz Talandar, which is the song of wonder. What's today, what will be tomorrow? Don't Let me ask you a curveball question, Matthew. How do you organize your music, your personal record collection or digital collection? Um, <laughs> I got sort of. Like, if you wanted to go and find it in your collection, where would you go? Um, Trop, etc. So I've got a folder which is Trop, etc., which is very broad. It's like lots of odd nuggets. It's like got Calypso in there. It's got Tropicalia from Brazil. Uh, yeah, that, that's where this one is located. Uh, I've got, obviously, more obvious folders like Jazz. Oh, I said the word Jazz when this, this happened. Magic. Charles Mingus, moaning, 1959. We're really going back in time. Absolutely. Well, Mingus is in here. He's representing all the jazz that I like because yeah, I could do a full 15 tunes obviously of just jazz oh, I love Coltrane I love Thelonious Monk Miles Davis Ornette Coleman Sun Ra but Mingus is probably my favourite this is a great example of some some of the Mingus I'd say there's like three essential Mingus albums which is uh, Mingus Ah Hum uh, Black Saint and the Sinner Lady and this one which is Blues and Roots this sounds to me like it, it sounds like both the church 
and the brothel. You know what I mean? It, it's somehow uh, sacred and extremely profane at the same time. It's like filthy. It's filthy and it's really, really in your face. Mingus was a bass player uh, and a band leader and composer and I love his composing, I love his, I love his compositions and I love just how absolutely in your face and filthy it all is. Yeah, I, I could have picked just so many of his tunes, but I went for this one. I mean, mainly because, like, listen to this. Yeah, listen to that <laughs> baritone saxophone hook. Is just like that. That is, tr you try and resist that. No, it's impossible. It's impossible to resist that. It's just spitting right in your face. It's the real deal. I'm sure I've heard that hook somewhere before. Probably, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. And so Mingus, a bit of a cliche, was evicted from his apartment in New York City uh, for non-payment of rent. That almost seems like a struggling artist cliche. Well, he got him. Yeah, he, he was a bit formidable. He was like a huge fella. I think he was. I think he was pretty ropey to work with, from some reports. But he had a, an amazing relationship with the drummer. Danny Richmond who plays on, on all these records I've mentioned and they, they would just be able to sort of switch into like double time just at the flick of an eyebrow there's not really any any big names big jazz names on, on this record apart from uh, uh, it's just it's just wonderful stuff it's just so sleazy so absolutely sleazy and also he's referred to as the angry man of jazz have you heard that? Right, well, that, that'll be his sort of, yeah, reputation for shouting at people. <laughs> I would fear him. I would be scared of him. I, but I wouldn't join his band. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1979. And when he did, it was discovered that he wrote uh, a two-hour-long piece called Epitaph, uh, which has since been recreated. I must check that out. Epitaph, yeah, two hours of jazz in one piece. But again, that just goes to show the sort of person he must have been that, you know, he, he worked on this but didn't tell anything about it. Yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, your epitaph is something that's supposed to be for, for when you die, isn't it? You don't die, though, do you? I heard on your planet you're uh, immortal, right? Yeah, well, it's not that Spore is an immortal. It's just that with certain technological advances, the Agriculans have managed to find a way to live indefinitely. Yeah, using cloned bodies and various other bits of, uh, you know, neural lace and things that, that can... Uh, AI, sort of computer, bionic technology, all that stuff. talking about maybe doing uh, an hour of jazz uh, when we finish when you finish the tour yeah uh, i'll take you up on that um i guess you, when you finish that tour you finish in november uh well we finish the uk part in november and then we go to europe for four weeks and then back for christmas and then back out again for another couple of weeks so we don't really finish touring until february oh wow so uh, i need to pick my time carefully then if i'm gonna get to talk about jazz yeah yeah, jazz club uh, is probably going to have to be, yeah, Christmas Eve. You doing anything on Christmas Eve? 
Christmas Eve. Maybe make Yorkshire puddings or something. Eggnog. So eggnog, eggnog, yeah. Maybe make an eggnog, yeah. I'm a fan of eggnog. I've no idea what it is. I've never had it before. It's an American thing, right? What is eggnog? It's an egg drink, <laughs> uh, which sounds potentially horrendous. It's it's nice, though. Yeah, it's nice. got, like, double cream. Put the double cream, and you beat it up with the egg yolk, and you put loads of sugar in it, and you can put rum or brandy or whiskey or something like that, some kind of spirit in it, and it's got... You put whole milk with cinnamon sticks and all that sort of Christmassy stuff and yeah it's flipping nice if you like a creamy drink <laughs> mulled wine and mince pies it's like why get good wine and then ruin it by mulling it and mince pies I don't know yeah no you need to get just just use shit wine for, for mulled wine yeah don't stick a nice shabbly in there and think, well shabbly's white wine anymore. but yeah don't stick a good one in do, do you know anything about wine? not really no I got a subscription to Naked Wines. No. They're usually pretty, but I've lost my sense of taste now because of Corona. With the COVID, yeah, yeah. They all taste the same. So I'm not get, I'm not get, you raiding this uh, wine cellar at the moment. Good old, good old uh, Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon. I'll be able to taste the cabinet, yeah. <laughs> Dusty old cabinet. Taste the cabinet. <laughs> Uses. Is that how you pronounce this guy's name? Evil, evil Usses. Evil Usses. Like in Bill and Ted. But the artist is Wellard J. Fowler. No. Uh, so the band is the Evil Usses. Right. The song is called Wellard J. Fowler, and that's named after the dog in right. EastEnders or something like that. Oh, Wellard Fowler. Right, yes. Now that makes sense. God almighty. Mm. What the most obscure... And it's like... It's, I found it on SoundCloud, and it's like, not got a lot of love, I'm going to say. Well, these, these are very uh, overlooked band. They're, they're from Bristol, trio. Sometimes performers. Four-piece, actually. Actually, they're four-piece. Yeah, they're, they're my favourite band. Um, you've got a few albums. This, this is from Muck, which came out in 2018, which is my favourite record of theirs. Probably my favourite record. Um, but yeah, it's just wonky, it's joyful. It's noisy. Again, it's just like really fun. And they're the great guys. We've played shows with them. And the, yeah, check them out. The Evil Losses. Buy their records. You won't want your money back. Twenty. Um, you were doing stuff in the studio there, Space Cassette, weren't you, as well as Hench? Yes, this is correct, yeah, yeah. So we did a, a Space Cassette TV takeover, which was, uh, I don't know if anyone saw it, it was chaos, because um, 
all of the crew got sent home. There was German crew, so they all got sent home to be locked down. This was in March 2020. It was the last party on Earth, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was knife edge stuff, as in, will people make it or not? Yeah, but let's not talk about that. So what, if the film crew all went, how the hell did you produce it then? Oh, yeah, it was just total chaos, but but we had a really complicated four hours of television programmed as well, which sort of semi came off, but... Yeah, it, it was a great way for us to sort of like learn how to do stuff, learn how to make really silly television. And we've done, uh, so obviously once everything was locked down, everyone's like, ah, we have to do live streams and stuff. It's the only way to do anything. So we created Space Cassette TV and did four episodes of like really fun, escapist, silly entertainment which I think helped people get through lockdown blues. Yeah, so it's been like everyone's sort of skilled up as as well. We, we've ended up going on from that. One of Henge is a video editor. Well, has learned how to do all of that over the last couple of years. And so we directed our own music video and edited it ourselves. Um, that's uh, If you want to have a look at that one, it's called Get Out of My House. There's loads of your stuff up on YouTube, well worth we're looking at. Uh, you, you know, all your music videos up there, really cool stuff. Definitely, people should be checking it out. Yes, yeah, go and go and get on the YouTube channel. Yeah, it, uh, it's a lot of fun. We should have some more on the way. There's always something on the way. No big old pile of jungle, everybody, everybody, please, please. I like the crew. I'll jump. Up. Also, we talked all the way through Felix Kubin. Uh, this is no dream. The, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to pin you down, man. And we need to talk about that real quick because this tune right now. Oh my god! But anyway. Watch this. Felix Cuban is a hero of mine. Is unbelievably obscure. I don't know why he's so obscure. Really, I don't. I don't know why people haven't heard of him. He's, uh, he's got some brilliant albums out there. Very much uh, a, an artist that harks back to the the period of synthesizer electronic music that I was talking about earlier in the 50s and 60s. Um, yeah, just a, a sort of a, a very eccentric guys from Hamburg. Um, for, again, one of those kind of like uses that stereotypical stoic German deadpan way of, of just being really fun and uh, that piece is just a, a really fast I think it's like 210 BPM it sounds like some kind of cra- crazy f- a fairground ride has, has kind of like become sentient and has taken over the fairground and I don't know he's going on a rampage it's ridiculous so i'm going through your 15 tunes and i'm like this guy's got fantastic taste in music and then i've come to prisoner featuring demolition man fire the urban shakedown remix to me now i don't know how you picked this one out mate but to me this is one of the top 10 jungle tunes of all time in my opinion yeah i had to have a jungle tune in there i mean in a way i I sort of i had to sacrifice quite a few things to make 15 tunes i didn't have i just like i didn't have any south american music and there's no african music i'm really interested just weird quirky outsider music i didn't put any of that in put a bit of jungle in it's obviously eternal for me it's uh, this with there's there's so much joy in this it's like literally the most joyous jungle tune i think out there and if if that's a qualifier which it usually is uh, for me also it really reminds me of a bang face and i think I think I'd heard it before, but like not really. I, I had a sort of like, it blew my mind. Uh, I think uh, Saint Acid played it in like a closing set. Maybe it was like 20, maybe it was 2017. Like yeah, it was. You know, obviously the closing parties there, they can be amazing. 
um, atmosphere because, yeah, just you've been through that whole weekend. You've had your ears battered and and fried. Your brain is completely rewired during the course of the Bang Face weekend. And then when it's been through all of that and just this, this absolute joy, wonderful drums and stuff, you know. I always call it Rave Christmas. It's better than Christmas. Totally. <laughs> it's absolutely better than Christmas. But yeah, this this will always remind me of Bang Face. Um, and uh, that's kind of why I put it in. The hype and the vocal, and then when that bass kicks in, oh. <laughs> there's a question I've been dying to ask you the whole way through this interview, uh, and I'm going to squeeze it in quick now. How the hell do you keep a plasma ball sellotape to the top of your head? Well, it's it's not sellotape, darling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> uh, when I first saw that, I mean, I've got to say, that's probably one of the first things most people go is like, what the hell? Mm. Oh, you know, it's it just, it, we, we defy physics. We've got our own way of, like, manipulating gravity. This is alien technology. Genius, by the way. Genius. You must smash a few of those on doors and stuff, though, right? It's happened. It has happened. But, you know, I'm, pr- I'm pretty careful. I-, I know to stoop when I'm walking through doors. Just the Bank Face 2020 when you did the fill-in as well. Last minute. That was that was epic as well, man. It was really, really fantastic to see you all on stage there. And I hope to see you again at Bank Face maybe at some point in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hope to be there in in May. 2020. 2022. Yeah. Well, uh, I hope you get back on that tour pretty damn quick, mate. And uh, enjoy the rest of it. Lovely. It's been a pleasure, mate. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to set the call and bring us 15 beautiful pieces of music. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Bye now. Ta-da. Bye-bye.